Welcome to Bread and Roses, everyone. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Wars Puya. We're sorry we were away for two weeks, but we're really glad to be back. And in this week's program, we're going to be talking about the elections in Iran. The circus is back in town. <laughs> it is, yes. Um, we have an interview with one of the greatest social activists in Poland, Nina Sankari, on secularism, atheism and resistance in Poland. We also have an insane fatwa, which is about a pilot being fined because he flew the plane on time. And our slice of life is... A musician from Mosul in Baghdad. Yeah, stay with us. It's going to be an excellent program, even if we do say so ourselves. The Iranian elections for uh, the next president of Iran is now underway. We know that out of all the various absurd candidates that have been uh, nominated, that have nominated themselves, six have been approved by the Guardian Councils and the Supreme Spiritual Leader Khamenei. I mean, it's very interesting. Um, 1,600, I think, 32, 34 people registered mm -hmm. but they're not people just registering doesn't mean anything you're not allowed to stand to to uh, be elected as president on the, the islamic regime of iran you have to be approved by the guardian council and this is a guardian council who actually you know it's a very limited number of mullahs who do you decide who can stand for mm -hmm. uh, election and this is the absurdity of any meaningful choice that people could have under the Islamic regime. Yeah. I mean, the reality is it shouldn't be called an election, you know, just because, you know, it's, it's really a farce. It's a show because, first of all, only those who are approved can even run. So you've got a situation where even Ahmadinejad, that was Khamenei's candidate in the past, is not allowed to run. So even some of the criminals of the regime aren't allowed to run. And the ones who are allowed are really, you know, their hands are drenched in blood. I mean, you've got someone like Qalibov, who was the head of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guards. You've got Raisi, who was part of the death commission in the 80s that massacred loads of political prisoners. You know, it's just one murderer after another those are the ones who are allowed to run yeah, it's absurd and, and, and this is and this is it so at any one time you'll see people um very limited um echelon of power in iran very limited group of people in between themselves to put a few people to to choose and actually by doing this by creating an environment as if people are going to register as if this is important they give a, a impression that people have the right to participate and that impression corrupts the meaning of mm. anything, any uh, right of people to, to choose. And that's what Islamists do in every aspect. You, yeah. you look at human rights. For example, as soon as you start talking about human rights, you start, no, hold on, there's no such thing as human rights. They want to create something called Islamic human rights, mm. which it corrupts the idea. Freedom. Then you don't have the uh, freedom to... The right to dress. It becomes yeah. the right to veil. I Absolutely. mean, it's constant... Everything. Yeah. Yeah. The Islamists yeah. corrupt everything yeah. and i think that's what the nature of religion in power is and that's why we insist that all institutions civil institutions where it decides the life of people should be separate from from religion and you could see the result of that yeah and, and and also i mean you know the issue of people being able to vote for a president you know in conditions which is really a dictatorship it's a totalitarian state where you know only those who abide by the system, accept the Islamic system, who are upstanding, righteous men are allowed to run. Women aren't allowed to run. Religious minorities aren't allowed to run. Dissidents and atheists and political opponents aren't. You know, you, you're talking about elections within a, a framework where there's no free press. There's no freedom of association and expression. It is a farce. It's a circus. And, you know, to think that um, this is considered 
by some, uh, you know, commentators as look at how, you know, free it is and how democratic it is. There are 1,600 candidates, you know, yeah, as you yeah. said, it's just a show uh, to make it seem as if it's, it means yeah. anything, but it doesn't. And I think there are people, some people who may be advocating to participate, but I think there might, there might be some benefit between Racy who's... As of to vote, you mean? To, to, yeah, yeah. To, sorry, to, uh, to vote in the election and yeah. participate. Yeah. Uh, because they say there, may, there might be different, there might be a difference between Rouhani and race. In reality, mm. we've seen time and again, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The Islamic regime is carries on and carries on and carries on. Mm. So that you know, to talk about participating and, and even voting. discussing, yeah. discussing the slightest change in the life of people in Iran or change in the establishment. Iran, it's impossible. It's impossible. So it gets to a point under this system. It's absolutely impossible. under yeah. this system, and it gets to a point that you got to say, look, no, everybody's got to say, no, this is wrong, fundamentally wrong, and do not participate. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of issues too. I mean, there's, there's, you know, there's always this distinction made between the conservatives and the reformist function, factions, and the reality is, if you look at, for example, the rule of Rouhani or Khatami before that, who were considered reformists. First of all, they were approved by the conservatives and the supreme spiritual leader and they've all played an important role in maintaining the Islamic regime and you know human rights violations and all the rules uh, Islamic rules continue nothing, nothing's nothing changed, changed no. so reform is also a farce because reform usually has real meaning yes and that's uh, that's the other yeah uh, that, that's the other concept between corrupted under the yeah, Islamic yeah. The, the idea is but also the idea that you know when you vote for such a system do you not play a role in legitimizing it as well and is it an important you know, to vote for your oppressor is the biggest tragedy, and and you know, honestly, it's a real tragedy that yeah. people would vote for such a situation. And, and, a and lot of people don't, though. Yeah, of course, of course but, uh, quite a lot of people yeah. don't. But those people who do, they then they have to have, be responsible and take responsibility for the consequences. They have to take responsibility for the consequences of the Islamic regime of Iran. That's why we advocate that this, you know, it's impossible to change anything within the Islamic regime of Iran. So that's why we're advocating complete boycott of the elections in Iran. Two weeks ago, we were at uh, the Atheist Weekend organized by the brilliant Nina Sankari in Warsaw, Poland, and we were able to interview her there. And it's a fantastic interview. You have to listen to it. I mean, the important points that uh, she makes is um, is creating a, a or reflecting the resistance against the church and the right-wing dominated um, state um, in Poland, who's trying to actually close every possible opportunity for people to um, express progressive and normal civil society, from women's right to right of to free thinking and everything else. You know, they even to the, to the point are saying the atheists and the, and the um, um, free thinkers have no right to to exist. Yeah, I know, and you, and you can see there's a lot of pressure on uh, atheist activists in that country, and it, again, it shows the relation of any religion in power or with access to power, and how it affects free thought and free thinkers and atheists in particular. I mean, it's a d discriminated group, and nonetheless, they're fighting back. And there's some wonderful examples of this fight back that Nina talks about. Some of them, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, absolutely. And articulating the reality of resistance in Poland and any diff many different countries it's such an important task and Nina and the group are doing this brilliantly there yeah. is a history of thinking differently this history of critical thinking and the, the history of it goes back to hundreds of years in yeah. Poland and that's what we're trying to do now watch this fantastic interview don't go away Sankari, welcome to our program. I wanted to speak to you about the fantastic Atheist Days that you hold every year. I've been to two of them. I think they're brilliant. Why do you have these Atheist Days? Poland is an undisputed leader in the field of clericalization of life. It is early entering all the fields, political, economical, uh, social, everything. So we, the atheists, have to stand up, we have to speak up and we have to oppose it. That's the main reason um, that uh, of uh, why we started this event. It is uh, meant 
to bring together the artists uh, from Poland, but not only, we have international guests uh, too. It is about to uh, confirm that we are here, we will be here, and that nobody has right to say us, uh, you don't have right to take the same streets as the holy procession do and to uh, threaten us with deportation and so on, that happened to some of our deputies. So we are there to confirm our right to freedom of conscience, to freedom of expression, freedom of media, of science, of art, etc. It is our right and that's why we are there. But also we would like to commemorate the death of the patron of our foundation and of all Polish atheist Kazimierz Wyszczyński, a nobleman and a philosopher who in 17th century uh, wrote a treaty, philosophical treaty, the non-existentia days so or of non-existence uh, of God, and he was very cruelly executed for it. So we would like to commemorate his death and to show also that the atheism in Poland was not brought uh, with, uh, on the bayonet of uh, Red Army, that atheism in Poland has long tradition. And at these atheist days you always talk about some of the really pressing issues and one of the things you talked about is women's rights and how women are attacked first, but there's also an awakening. Explain that. Yes, so-called democratic transition uh, had and still has a fatal flaw on it. It is the alliance of the altar and the church and the state, altar and uh, yes, uh, power, uh, governmental power in Poland. And the first uh, thing which was done under this alliance, it was, uh, it were a very strong attacks on women's rights, especially on reproductive women's rights and it was ban on abortion imposed in Poland with some exceptions and now there are uh, even t uh, tentatives to impose a total ban on abortion regardless uh, women's life treat to uh, women's lives regardless any condition so uh, women's raised up and it is for the first time uh, since uh, this democratic uh, transition that a lot of m women are uh, raised in the protest because their fundamental rights are really attacked, their lives are attacked. And so on 3 October last year there was a huge protest of women huge one never seen before and uh, we all uh, were dressed in black so uh, it was so called black monday uh, our foundation took very active part in this protest and uh, this movement of uh, protesting women and you can see there our poster that we've done uh, and uh, always uh, holding with us during the protest. It says, uh, ban on abortion kills. And you can see there a woman uh, who is almost dying after performing illegal abortion in very unsanitary conditions because the legal abortion was refused to her. And it is based on a real story. It is not just invented. And uh, the um, fight that you have is on many fronts because at your atheist days there was discussions around education, in theatre, you know, uh, people's expression in various ways. And what surprised me the most is there's huge fights taking place, fight backs that we don't hear about much. So tell us one about the crucifix and the math teacher because I think that's interesting for people to know about. 
Yes, I would like just to say that attacks on women's rights are always, not only in Poland, just the beginning of subjugation of the whole society. It's almost always the beginning of totalitarian, authoritarian regimes, and it is uh, the case in Poland too. So, uh, yes, we have a lot of fights. One of them is uh, a fight for secular school. There being a project, it is uh, still in the parliament without any chances now, but still we collected uh, more than 150,000 signatures for this project of secular school. And one of our speakers uh, during the uh, panel of Eti's days was Grażyna Juszczyk. By the way, she was awarded our uh, Eti's of the Year award in the national category for what she's done. Uh, and what she's done, uh, she just uh, took off the cross uh, from the teacher's room. And then she was so much uh, persecuted for this act that she, uh, uh, she went to the court uh, to fight for her citizens' rights. And it took more than three years and finally she won. It was a very big victory for all uh, Poles, all Polish atheists, I mean. And the judge in the final sentence said that nobody, the, the um, dominant, dominant majority of Catholics uh, has no right to discriminate and persecute others, the man minorities. So we are really very happy with this sentence and that's also why she was awarded this prize. But as you said, our fights are of, on so many fronts because it started with women's rights, but now the whole democracy is under attack because of this alliance of church and state. And we have, for example, science which uh, starts uh, to be attacked and uh, there are scientists who are under pressure to accept, for example, NOMA, non-overlapping magisteria, saying that science and, and, uh, and uh, religions uh, are completing each hour, uh, which is not right at all. We have attacks on uh, evolutionary bi biology in at schools and universities, and creationism is, is taking step, is advancing, so we don't want it, we oppose it. We have uh, also <coughs> a very big attacks on art on freedom of art and that's why uh, we had on our on our panel also professor golik a very famous polish evolutionary biologist we've uh, we've had there a very known famous actress eva skibinska who was telling us how the freedom of of um, of art is now uh, limited. Mm -hmm. How there uh, some pieces of theater I, are taken off the uh, affiche. So they cannot play several play. For example, several um, drama. They cannot play if it is related to God. It is judge blasphemous. We don't have really blasphemy law in Poland, but we have a bastard of canon law on blasphemy. It is the defense of religious feelings. And under this law, many freedoms are limited in Poland. Yeah, so, uh, in a way, that's one of the reasons why you also recognized uh, Fosier uh, Ilias, one of the recipients of your international award, along with Michael Nugent, because you do understand very deeply how dangerous blasphemy laws can be. 
Yes, it is. Uh, that's right. Uh, um, Fausia Elias was nominated to us, even if she got uh, two separate nominations, and we uh, are really happy that then the jury uh, awarded uh, her the, uh, this prize because uh, even though in Poland we are still not uh, murdered for atheism, but in other parts of the world it is happening daily and we have to protest and we've done a protest against blasphemy laws, stop and blasphemy laws and we are really happy that Fauzia could uh, take a micro and speak about what is going on in Pakistan, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia and many other countries where the Islamists are in power. As a final question, I mean, the thing is too, though, that still there are risks involved for people like yourself. I mean, we know there was a bomb threat against the event that you organized and you've had other sorts of uh, things happen to you and to other atheists. Tell us about working under those conditions. Okay, we still can work and that's uh, what we are really uh, defending, our freedoms we are defending. There are threats, there are every year we have some threats of bomb attack uh, in the restaurant where, where we are our uh, gala dinner, uh, uh, in the halls we are doing our conference. Every year there are treats, but until now nothing really bad happened. But it doesn't mean that we don't have to be uh, careful. On the other side, we cannot stop, we cannot give up. And so I think it is a common a fight for freedom of conscience, expression, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mariam. The insane fatwa this week is from Zahedan, Iran, and it is the fact that a pilot has been fined and suspended for 15 days because he flew the plane on time. Fine. Not only the pilot, everybody who was working on the plane. Of course. Yes. And do you know why? Because he flew the plane on time? No, but that's not enough. Hmm. You know, you, you usually, because he did not wait for 25 mullahs who wanted to pray on a tarmac, because as they were walking to, <laughs> to get on a plane, they decided it's time to pray so, and they said the plane has got to stop this is important so started praying and the pilot said no <laughs> pull up the, the pilot decided to do his job and fly the plane and, and he flew away and uh, interestingly it seems uh, they've all been given free tickets now this is as outrageous. if as if the pilot did something wrong so this is the thing if you want next time you're late for your flight do you know what you say i was praying <laughs> Can I was I, can, busy praying. Can I have my free ticket? Yeah, free That's ticket, right, please. Yeah. No, no, no. And especially with my last name, Namazi, I That's should just it. be getting free That's tickets it. You everywhere. You walk around and get free tickets. <laughs> yeah. it insane. insane, insane. It only happens oh. on the Islamists. And we're not making this stuff up. This was in the news. What can we say? Amin Makdad is a violinist in Iraq and he has played in secret even though uh, under ISIS rule in that area music was banned, his house was raided, his instruments were destroyed. Nonetheless, he used to keep playing in secret and now he's playing out in the open. You know, it's absolutely beautiful to watch, isn't it? Yeah, he's playing his music in areas, in public area of uh, his scenes of destruction result of ISIS dominance is everywhere to be seen and how could humanity be without music yeah. really? and that's just yeah. part and parcel of being human religion and ISIS and various types of Islamist organization can't take that away mm. from us yeah and you know it is a testament to the human spirit isn't it and it's such a heartwarming scene to see so it's you know definitely a great slice of life this week yeah. we'll end 
with this wonderful um, piece of his music playing in Mosul, Eastern Mosul. And we hope that we'll see you again at the same time and same place next week. Until then, have a fantastic week. Goodbye. Goodbye. كانت تحب الموسيقى بس تخاف تعترف بالموضوع ليش؟ لان اكو جهات خفيه تفايتها احنا كنا رافعين هذا اللواء والراي انه احنا ضد كنا معرضين للقتل يعني رغم هذا الدمار بعدنا نحلم بعدنا نفرح بعدنا نسمع موسيقى الموسيقى شيء جميل وكل شيء يكره الموسيقى هو قبيح And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.